Hallelujah. Welcome back to the channel tonight. I'm so glad that you could join us. Tonight, I'm going to be sharing a word with you titled, What Goes On Behind Closed Doors. And I'm sure we've all heard that saying, what goes on behind closed doors is nobody else's business. So let's get right into the word, Matthew 5, chapter 5, verse 19 and verse 20. <clears throat> Say amen when you get there. Matthew 5, starting in the 19th verse. Amen. Okay. Whosoever therefore shall break one of the least of these commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Father God, we come before you in the name of Jesus, Lord. God, I humble myself before you, Lord. I surrender myself to you, Holy Spirit. I cannot do this without you. I depend upon you, Holy Spirit. I ask you, Lord, to breathe life upon this word. Let me speak your words and your words alone. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, the Pharisees were lawyers. They were expert in the law of Moses. They studied it and they knew it backward and forward. And for their teachings, for the most part, were right on the money. But unfortunately, their lives were not always right with God. And Jesus had a lot to say about this. He told them in Matthew 23, 1, it says, Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. So when I think about the scribes and the Pharisees, I get a picture in my mind of a homeowners association. I'm sure we've all seen the commercial where the lady's walking around with the tape measure, checking everything on all the neighbor's houses. And she's out with a chainsaw, cutting a mailbox down because it's an inch too tall. I was uh, at work this last week and I was sharing with the mailman. We were speaking about homeowners association. And he was telling me there is this really nosy lady in his homeowners association and she would nitpick over the tiniest little things. His mailbox was white and he put black letters on his mailbox. Excuse me, he put black numbers on his mailbox. His house number on his mailbox. And she came and brought this up to the homeowners association because the mailbox was only allowed to be one color. And they had a meeting. And he said, wait a minute. He goes, aren't you the lady whose house is painted Pepto-Bismol pink? <laughs> Here's this lady worried because somebody put black numbers on his white mailbox because it didn't fit the color scheme of the homeowners association. Yet, her house was painted an obnoxious color of pink that was not in the scheme of the homeowners association. And this is kind of how it was with the scribes and Pharisees. Jesus said that they would strain a gnat. They would get a, a sieve and they would strain to keep a gnat from going in. And then they would turn and swallow a camel. They would, these tiny little nitpicking things, and they let the big ones go by. You know, they made sure they washed their hands before they ate. They made sure things were done right on the Sabbath. But when it came to love, they didn't have any. Mm. You know, Jesus talked about the uh, stranger that was fell among thieves. And there was a 
there was a, a Levite going by and he saw him in the ditch and he passed by on the other side. And a Pharisee came by and he passed by on the other side. And finally a Samaritan came along and he picked him up, put him on his donkey and took him to the inn and he nursed him to health. The others were too worried about doing God's work to help someone who had fallen among thieves. Mm -hmm. So they, they picked at the little things in the law and they totally missed the big items. So what we're talking about here tonight are hypocrites. We're going to talk about hypocrites tonight. What is a hypocrite? Well, number one, the, uh, the most common word used for hypocrisy or hypocrites in the New Testament, in the Greek, is the word hypocrisis. And it means acting under a feigned part. That is figuratively deceit, condemnation, dissimulation. Now, I think that the Greek is a little more forgiving, whereas in the Hebrew, the word is chenef, and it means soiled with sin. So it basically, it's a fake righteous person. But that word soiled with sin, I'm going to tell you what comes to my mind when I hear the word soiled. I remember, um, now today, uh, women have children and and we have pampers and huggies and all these different disposable diapers. Well, when I was young, my little sister was born and we had my niece that lived with us and they didn't get pampers. We always, back then, we looked down on people that used pampers. My mom said, oh, that's just because they want to be able to let them go dirty a little longer, you know. And we used cloth diapers with the pins. And my mom had a diaper pail and she would take those diapers that were soiled and put them in the diaper pail and they would soak. And there was such a stench that came from that diaper pail. That's the image that I get when I hear the word soiled. And they soaked there. And that room where the diaper pail was, was permeated with the smell of it. Now, when I was a young man, when I first got saved, and this might have actually been before I got saved, but we would sneak out. We were in the Baptist church. We would sneak out in between Sunday school and church, and we'd slip out to the car, and we'd smoke a cigarette. But we'd always be sure that we got some chewing gum and popped it in our mouth to fool everybody, to get the smell of cigarettes out of our mouth. But what we didn't realize, folks, and I didn't realize this until I quit smoking, but there is a stench of that cigarette that remains on your clothing. I, that would not have fooled anybody. I, I can smell somebody today that smokes a cigarette from 30 feet away because you carry it with you. And it's the same way with hypocrisy. The only person you're fooling is yourself. So number one, what is a hypocrite? Is a fake righteous person. They do things in front of everybody to be seen, but then what goes on behind closed doors, they don't want anyone to know. Number two, what is a hypocrite? A hypocrite is a narcissist. So what is a narcissist? Well, I can tell you two presidents. One's a Democrat, one's a Republican. This way, I can tell about both of these men and I'm not gonna offend anyone. Barack Obama, he is a narcissist. Donald Trump, and I guarantee you, everybody can agree with me that Donald Trump is a narcissist. Both of these men are very much loved, and both of these men are very much despised. One is loved by the left and despised by the right. The other is loved by the right and despised by the left. So I can speak freely about both of these men. What do narcissists do? They make everything about themselves. I, uh, a uh, lovely young lady, Diamond, from Diamond and Silk passed away, and President Trump did her eulogy and ended up talking about himself. Because with the narcissist, everything is about that person. 
And when you think of uh, hypocrites like I'm talking about tonight, these are people who they want to be out in front of everyone. Jesus said they made long prayers because they do it to be seen of men. But Jesus said, when you pray, enter into your closet. Those are the things that we should do behind closed doors. Amen. Uh, and in Matthew 6, chap, uh, chapter 6, verses 2 through 6, Jesus talks about this, about when you give alms, don't sound a trumpet like the hypocrites do. And when you fast, when he talks about when he fasts. Now, in, in the biblical times, people would sit in sackcloth and ashes. They would humble themselves in the sight of God. But the hypocrites would go out in public with ashes on their head. And they'd disfigure their face. Oh, I'm so hungry. Look how holy I am. Okay, Jesus said, when you fast, wash your face. Don't put ashes on it. Wash your face and anoint your head with oil. Because every Jew would anoint their head. They thank God for the oil to anoint their head with. So that you don't appear to men to be fasting. You're doing this behind closed doors to be seen of God rather than to be seen of men. Number three, what is a hypocrite? Someone that does the opposite of what they say. Example, somebody who teaches to avoid sex outside of marriage. But then, late at night, after everyone has gone to bed, they slip out in their car. And in the shadows, in the corners, they find a prostitute and they solicit them for sex. That is a hypocrite. Someone who says these things yet turns around and goes and does the, ver does the very things that they're teaching against. Paul had this to say about this. Oh, before I go to that, I just want to mention something. Um, I had a pastor when I was in the Nazarene church, Pastor Ward Hall. He's pastoring a little church up in the city of Brooksville now. He used to always say, the person that you are when you think nobody's watching you, that is the person that you really are. What you do behind closed doors is the person you really are. And here's what Paul had to say about this. Paul says in Romans chapter 2, starting in the 21st verse, he says, Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest not thou thyself? Thou that preachest, a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest, a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God? Now, Paul was a very unique person to be saying this because Paul was a Pharisee. Paul was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was a teacher of teachers. Paul knew exactly who the Pharisees were. He knew how they behaved. And the thing with Paul, Paul, when, you know, when Jesus talks in Revelation about, I would that you were hot or cold, but that you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. Paul was red hot. Paul did what he did as a Pharisee because of a zeal for God that he had. Because it was a real zeal for God. When he persecuted the Christians, he thought that he was doing God's service. He wasn't doing it as a hypocrite. He was doing it as a real person. And thank God, thank God for that road to Damascus experience that he had. Where Jesus revealed himself to him. So only a Pharisee could really address this the way Paul did. Because Paul knew how the Pharisees were. Paul saw how they were, a lot of them were phonies, and a lot of them were fakes. 
They did everything to be seen of men, to have the uppermost rooms at feasts. Amen? So, signs of hypocrisy in our lives. Number one, number one sign of hypocrisy in our life is that you are living a double life. Maybe you go to church every Sunday. Maybe you go to church every Wednesday. Maybe you even act like a Christian when you're at home, around your family. But when you go to work, you sit there and you join in in all of the gossip. You stand by the water cooler. You listen to the dirty jokes. You may tell some of them. You're probably laughing at them when you should turn around and walk away from them. Let me ask you, how many people on your job even know you're a Christian? And if they were asked, if you never told them you were a Christian, if they were asked, what would they say? Do they know? Can they tell? Everybody on my job knows that I am a pastor. I don't hide it. Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me, I will be ashamed of you. Don't be ashamed of Christ. So when you walk outside of the four walls of the church, you need to be the same person when you're outside of the church as you are when you are inside of the church. Amen. Um, now, when I was a very young man, I was going to, I believe it was a Nazarene church, but it was a church who did not have a pastor at the time. And one of the pastors, they brought several men of God in to try out to be the pastor of the church. And one of the men, I wish I could remember his name. God bless him. He was such a good guy. Um, he drove the Tom's potato chip truck, you know, Tom's potato chips, right? And he was out on his route one day and he goes into a church, uh, excuse me, he goes into a bar and he's there to, to see what they need to make sure that they're fully stocked. This was part of his job. And there bellied up to the bar was one of the members of the Nazarene church. Now, here's the thing about the Nazarene church. The Nazarene Church, before they took on the name the Nazarene Church, they were called the Pentecostal Church of Holiness. And holiness is their thing. Their claim to fame is holiness. In fact, their theme song is, Holiness unto the Lord is our watchword and song. Holiness unto the Lord as we're going along. Sing it, shout it, loud and long. Holiness unto the Lord, now and forever. So, here's a member of the Nazarene Church, bellied up to the bar, sucking down a beer, and he sees the pastor come in. Hey, preacher, what you doing in here? And the barmaid looked at him and she says, this is my potato chip man. And he looked back at the guy sitting at the bar and he goes, the real question is, what are you doing here? Okay. He was at every service on Sunday and every service on Wednesday. But yet in between time, he was bellied up to a bar in a tavern, sucking down beers. That is hypocrisy. Living a double life. Number two. You get used to sin. You know, as long as we live on this earth, there will be sin. We're going to miss the mark. We're going to fail God. We're going to come short of the glory of God. The Bible says all men have sinned and come short and fallen short of the glory of God. So it's going to happen. We're going to sin. But when it stops bothering you, you know, when, when we miss it, there's going to be times maybe we get angry. Maybe we have an outburst or something. We should feel just horrible when that happens. We maybe, maybe we fall to some temptation. Whatever the case may be. But it should just make you feel awful when you do it. 
And that's the Holy Spirit working on the inside of you, telling you that you messed up. When you stop feeling that, you are in a very, very dangerous place. You are entering into the realm of hypocrisy once you get there. Now, the Word of God says in 1 Timothy. Now, I'm going to give you the first verse because I, want to, I don't want to be accused of taking this out of context. But it applies and it fits here. 1 Timothy 4, 1. And it says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heeds to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. So, how we get to that place is by having our consciences seared with a hot iron. I used to do martial arts. And the martial art that I did was Taekwondo. And we had a thing called a Taoyong Bong. And it was a board about this wide and about this long. And it was wrapped round about with a hemp rope. And we put this on the wall. And we would come there and we would just repeatedly pound our fist in that and twist our fist as we did it to build calluses up on our knuckles so that when we punch wood or punch concrete, we don't tear the skin and injure ourselves. So what happens is when you get so used to sinning and sinning and sinning, you're building up calluses on your heart and the Holy Spirit loses the ability to be able to speak to you. Remember, the Lord was not in the fire. The Lord was not in the wind. But the Lord came in a still, small voice. We need to be sensitive to that still, small voice. So, number three. You start making plans to sin. Signs that hypocrisy is present in your life and is when you start planning to sin. Not, oops, I made a mistake, but, oh, I'll go and do this. I mean, remember Samson. You know, it, it wasn't until the end, well, I'll just go out and shake myself as at other times, and he didn't know that the Lord had departed. Okay? So, the Catholic Church, I've heard these stories where hitmen would come in to sit in the confessional with the priest. You know, and they may maybe, Hey, uh, Father, I'm, uh, I gotta go break somebody's kneecaps tonight, so what you want I should do to be absolved of this sin, huh? Well, give me $20,000. <laughs> Whatever the case may be, but they were going to the priest in advance of committing a sin to have it absolved. Which, you know, I'm sorry, but only Jesus Christ can absolve your sins. There is one mediator between God and man, and that is the man, Jesus Christ. We don't need to sit in a booth and speak to a man with a white collar on. We can go directly to Jesus who takes it before the Father for us. But when you get to the point where you start making plans to sin because you know God's merciful and he'll forgive you, you're in a dangerous, dangerous place and you need to do an about face. So what can I do? Number one, very simple, repent. If you have any of these signs in your life, you need to get down on your face before God and cry out to Him. God, make me sensitive to you, to your word, to your rules. Lord, make my heart ache when I commit sin. Lord, make me hate sin as much as you hate sin. You need to repent and cry out to God. Pray 
for God. This is number two. I just said it. But number two is pray for God to make you hate sin. You know, read the read uh, Romans chapter 7. Paul talks about this. He says, that which I do I allow not, but that which I hate that I do. This is a struggle that every man deals with. Some just stop dealing with it and they enter off into that dangerous place. But cry out to God to make you hate it. And lastly, what goes on behind closed doors should be all of your good deeds. You know, I see so many times where uh, ministry is raising money and they say, Oh, we want to thank uh, Bill so-and-so for giving $1,000. No. No. Don't put your name on it. Tell them, let it be anonymous. Let that be anonymous because you want your reward to come from God, not from having your name declared on a television. Do you want to be better than the scribes and Pharisees? Jesus said we have to be if we want to enter into the kingdom of God. Do it secretly. Jesus said, don't let your left hand know what your right hand does. When you do good works, don't tell anybody about it. If they find out, that's fine. But do it to make your Father in Heaven happy. Do it to please Him. Don't do it for men, folks. So what I want to do tonight, I want to lead you guys in a prayer. If you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior if you don't know for certain that you're going to heaven. If you're backslidden tonight and you need a Savior, I want you to pray this prayer with me and mean it in your heart. Father, I come before you in the name of Jesus. Lord, I have sinned. I am a sinner and I am sorry for my sin. Lord, I know that it was my sin that put your son, Jesus Christ, on that cross. And Lord Jesus, I thank you for bearing the punishment of my sin on that cross. Lord, I ask you to forgive me of my sins and come into my heart. I accept you, Lord Jesus, as my Savior right now. And I confess you as my Lord. And I ask you to help make me a better person and help me to live for you. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you said that prayer last night, or excuse me, if you said that prayer with us today, I want you to put something in the comments. Let us know. And if you're new to the channel, please subscribe. Hit the like button and share this video with your friends. God bless you. We love you and we'll see you next week. Amen.